Hello. Wonderful to be here with you. You're very welcome to this edition of the Advocacy Exchange. Thank you for making time to spend the next hour together thinking about caregiving and self-care, self-care in the midst of caregiving. We're very pleased to be able to share the experience with you and look forward to supporting each other as we dig into what we can all agree is this essential topic in advocacy and also in our personal lives in so many ways. So we thank you for investing the time with us. For those who have not had the good fortune to meet, my name is Brad Love. I'm a great co-founder and health outcomes researcher. And we are lucky to have what I can only describe as an incredibly powerful panel with us today that you'll meet in just a few moments. Before we get there, I would like to thank and point out that we have two ASL interpreters with us today, Mackenzie Belez and Emily Cook. If you could benefit from their work, please click on the three little dots in the corner of their video and you can pin them to your screen. Before we get going though, as caregiving is such a common experience to being a person, quite honestly, but also advocacy work, I'd love to see in the chat, if you don't mind sharing, what's your top caregiving self-care tip? How do you manage yourself when you're in caregiving mode? We know it's an essential topic. It's one we often look past because we're seeking to give of ourselves. But what do you do to maintain yourself when you're in caregiver mode? And we'll sit for a minute as people click through and as some responses come in to that in the chat. Your top tip for self-care during caregiving. Breathing. Nancy, you are on to something glorious there. We do forget when we get wrapped up, don't we? Yeah, and as Ben puts some permission to step away, for sure. Audiobooks and nice meals. Yeah, Doug, isn't that it? We do what we can to help, as our panelists are going to discuss today, but we can't be perfect. Yeah, and Dory... That is the answer for so many of us, which is why we're here together, but how we mutually support in this advocacy community, such that we hope to learn more today and create some opportunity, some space for that. David, I love thinking about creating a space from which one can care. And yeah, Nancy agreed. We so often have difficult times with this. Thank you you all for sharing those. And D, what a reminder to say something nice to yourself about yourself. That seems like real important wisdom for kind of every day of being a person. So constructive. And even these are just small ways we support each other in our advocacy and caregiving journeys. So thank you for sharing those tips. As we move into today's program, a couple of notes I would like to make, if not, frankly, celebrations, I'm going to argue. As many of you know, we're privileged to have a partnership with Bristol Myers Squibb to bring the advocacy exchange to you. And one of the reasons that we value them is that they put great care into learning from patients. It's foundational for them, I would personally argue. And for the eighth year, BMS is devoting an entire week to patients and this idea. 19 to 23 September is their global patient week. They're the first biopharma company to set aside dedicated time to celebrate and honor the many patients they help every day and are striving to do more for the patients who do not yet have options. If you'd like to learn more about Global Patient Week, please visit the link in the chat. And on that note, another celebration is we're privileged to have a very special member of the BMS team with us here today who will be your moderator someone who cares very deeply about patients and positive outcomes, no doubt. She also happens to be the first ever moderator for an advocacy exchange event. So this is a return demand appearance that we're very fortunate to have, Catherine Owen. Catherine's not new to BMS, but has just stepped into a new role of Senior Vice President and General Manager for US commercialization. And we're so thrilled to have her with us for this important discussion. Welcome, Catherine. I'll pass it over to you, and I look forward to seeing everyone at the end for a quick wrap-up. Thank you so much, Brad. I am so delighted to be back with our GRIT team, and more importantly, all of you. Um, 
as Brad says, this is my second time I was involved in the first advocacy exchange, and I couldn't be more passionate about the subject today, that of being a carer. So obviously, I work for a pharmaceutical company. I have a strong uh, focus on patients every day. Um, we, we work with patients in oncology, with cardiovascular disease, and with immunological disease really as our main focus. But as a as a caregiver myself to parents who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and more recently, um, a husband suffering from heart disease. I'm relating to this from both a professional level, but also much more from a personal level. And so I think today we're gonna to hear some powerful stories from two amazing women who have been kind enough to share, to agree to share their caregiving story with all of us. And um, I'm so delighted to welcome Heather and Josie, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, Heather joins us from the East Coast of the US, and Josie has been gracious enough to join us from her home in Singapore, where it's currently very close to midnight. And so we're excited to have both of these women um, share their story with us. So I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself briefly to everybody out here, um, maybe a little about what you're doing right now. And then we're going to ask each of you to take us into a really personal journey and share a little bit more about your care, um, your care journey with the wider team. And then from there, we'll, we'll take some questions. I've got some questions prepared, but obviously helpful. If there's any in the chat, we can kind of go between the two. So um, Heather, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Absolutely. Thank you and good morning. My name is Heather Bat. I'm currently the Executive Director of Research at the Cancer Support Community. My background um, was in corporate America. And six and a half years ago, my husband and I were concurrently diagnosed with cancer, which led me to uh, change jobs. I have two boys that are teenagers, one in high school and one in college. And I'm really pleased to have this as an important topic today to speak about personally and professionally. So thank you. Heather, we're excited to hear your story. And Josie, um, welcome, and thank you for joining us from Singapore. Please share with the group your um, your focus areas for today. Hi, good morning and uh, good evening. <laughs> Whichever part of the world you are, like uh, uh, Catherine said, is like close to midnight here in Singapore. Um, I am a mother um, of three kids. Um, I have retired from work for about two years now to be a full-time caregiver for my daughter. I was a part-time caregiver for my daughter like nine and a half years ago, which I almost lost her. Uh, we can share that a little bit more uh, soon. I'm currently, uh, like I say, a retiree. I'm also uh, volunteering with the Sing Health uh, Patient Advocacy Network, uh, as you can see in the screen. Uh, hopefully in my way of uh, going back to the community and helping a bigger group of patients and the future of patients out there. So I'm looking forward to the conversation this evening uh, or this morning. And definitely um, I hope to be able to not just to share. I also hope that I could enrich myself with a big pool of uh, many individuals here. And perhaps in that could also uh, help me on my journey as a caregiver. Thank you. Josie, thank you so much. And and so why don't we we start with you actually sharing your personal journey uh, with your daughter and um, just tell the group a little bit about the journey that you were on and maybe some of the key decisions that you faced along the way um, to take you to where you are today. So I'm going to let you share that story with the team. Sure, thank you. Uh, my story went back about nine and a half years ago. Um, I almost lost my daughter at the age of 18 uh, for an unknown reason. Uh, we brought her to the hospital and some 15 hours later, they could not diagnose what's happening, but they're telling us that all her organs are shutting down. And that hit our whole family like a boat of lining because she was never been sick before. And, um, and before you knew it, she's actually in the CT ICU on the ECMO machine. Um, and the doctor says that she only had 20% chance of survival. And obviously it is definitely very devastating to our whole family. We have no idea what to ask, we have no idea what ECMO is. 
and we can only be able to, you know, um, depend on the doctor. And the doctor say we have just to have to observe her. And what went through that period of time was really, really very painful for us to be dealing with all this. And, and it's like 30 hours has gone by. So what happened has happened is that we have, we have no idea what question to ask. So the only thing I could remember then was like asking the doctor, when could my daughter wakes up? And he said he doesn't know. Um, but I told him that my daughter has never been to the hospital. Please call us when she's awake. So what has happened is around about midnight, this young doctor came running to us and she said, and he was like uh, running and said, Mrs. Kong, Mrs. Kong, I think uh, your daughter is waking up. And our whole family went in to the ICU and we could only wave to her uh, from outside of the glass panel and trying frantically to call her name to reassure her that we whole family are here with her and uh, we want her to hear our voice. And throughout that night, this young doctor continuously kept us uh, in the loop as to what's happened. And at one point, he actually uh, stated that my daughter urine, urinated. And, you know, to us, most of us, we felt that, what is that? We have no idea. Is she urine? To say, that's a very good sign because that means that her kidney is working well. And we were so elated. We actually cheered and said, oh, my God. You know, at least one organ is working, and and obviously through the weeks and through the days, uh, they really, really kept a very good care of my daughter. It was really like a big family looking after my daughter and watching her, and and that kept us going. Um, and what this doctor did, you know, it may seems like a very small act, but I think the very fact he remembered and he came running to us. Um, demonstrated his compassion to really trying to allay our anxiety at that point in time. And we really felt very, very grateful for what he has done. And his is really what we call, I could call setting a ripple effects of what he has done, that little touch and the little moments from then on, uh, little improvement that my daughters make, we actually cheer. And he has had to seal that compassion with us that we are truly grateful. And with that, he actually allowed us to create a relationship that we have at the Heart Center. Until today, we, we, we had a great relationship with the Heart Center. And there were many, many uh, moments and many people that I could name. Uh, so honestly, it was a miracle that my daughter actually survived, uh, but her heart could not get to the EF that is needed to be off the ECMO. And with that, she has been implanted with the left ventriculator artificial device uh, with a bridge of heart transplant. And, and this journey, I think some five, in five and a half years later, her right heart starts to fail. And with that, she has to undergo another open heart surgery and implanted the second uh, vent ventriculator artificial device to her right heart so now she's actually armed with two controllers four batteries 24 7 so it, it's become tougher in this journey uh, um, and i'm very happy to say that today uh, last july she successfully went through a heart transplant and it's now post 14 months um, in stable condition and she's recovering very well so you know we truly believe that with faith and love is really make the impossible possible. And there's so many, so many uh, people that we can think of beyond just the family, the extended family, friends, and many in the healthcare, they really, really show so much love and care for my daughter that we are truly, truly very, very grateful for that. So, and, and, and that really helped me uh, to reassure myself, to say that there's something that we have to give back. And that's where I actually joined the uh, Sing Health Advocacy, Patient Advocacy Network. Yeah, maybe over back to you and we can talk more later. Josie, that's such a powerful story. Thank you so much for sharing it with this group. Um, I, I have an 18 year old daughter right now. I can't even imagine what it must have been like for you to have been one day 
she's happy and healthy and the next day her organs are shutting down and uh, I'm sure we all have have lots of questions that I'm looking forward to to asking you because the journey you've been on must have been um, just from a from a motherly level one journey but as an advocate you know a, a different journey as well and those two perspectives I think will, will help all of us um, so I'm gonna um, put that question on hold for just a minute um, and ask Heather to share her story with us and then we're going to have the ability to move between the two of you with some some new insights on on this amazing journey you've both been on so Heather why don't you share a little more of your story with our team absolutely and thank you Josie so January 13th 2016 uh, I got a new job which was caregiver to my husband who was diagnosed with esophageal cancer which I had never heard of before so I think for most of us, all of a sudden, one day something happens and you need to become an expert in listening, organizing, making decisions in a category that you're probably not that informed of. Um, I was extremely fortunate that emotionally and logistically, I had a wonderful community, local family. I physically lived near excellent medical care. And I happened to make a critical decision a week later, which was um, figuring out like what's in my control. And I decided to move a mammogram forwards. So in hindsight, one of my comments for today is taking, you know, as a caregiver, your health needs to always go first. So keeping that screening appointment, um, it turned into that I had triple negative breast cancer and so in a week and a half, uh, I became a caregiver and a patient. My husband's diagnosis was uh, more dire. And so uh, immediately we had to pivot to also thinking of our children. And both while trying to figure out appointments, diagnoses, treatments, we had to figure out our finances, our will, our, um, I didn't know where all the passwords were for certain bills that my husband paid that I didn't typically pay. Uh, so, and I consider us like we had most of those things in reasonable working order, but very quickly, everything needed to be relooked at in our life. And our children became our primary concern and things move fast. Whatever you get diagnosed with, you need to immediately start doing things. And my kids were 10 and 13 at the time. So they weren't too young, but they weren't too old. So they certainly knew we were acting strange. And so we needed to be communicating with them quickly and finding information or support to help inform us on what to say or how to say it was very difficult. Um, the healthcare systems put us in a queue where we would have had to wait three weeks to meet with someone to help advise us. We didn't have three weeks to hold off on a conversation. And we did a lot of research on our own, did our best to navigate some conversations and so fortunate that concurrently the cancer support community, Greater Philadelphia location had a grant supporting a program at my son's middle school at the time that he was able to participate in. And so he over five weeks was invited to participate in a session that was half informative and half a space to talk if you chose to, there were five or six kids in the program, but that altered the trajectory of how I used my emotional energy in terms of caregiving in my home, because he was learning things I wouldn't have known to discuss with him. So he was getting knowledge that was age appropriate of uh, tidbits about cancer. And so when I had to discuss that I was going to be losing my hair, he was, he was, <laughs> excited about it because he knew that meant there were things happening in my body that were getting rid of the cancer. And that was a good thing to be happening where I was petrified to be telling him because I thought it would be traumatic. And so the way that I was able to use what I had within me was able to, to pivot. And so I quickly wanted to gather all the learnings that I was getting because you don't know what you don't know about something until you're in that moment. And my husband had a ton of complications and he wanted me at the hospital with him. And I had to be making decisions as a caregiver of how to take care of myself 
and my children and where and when to be present. Uh, and hard decisions come up. I mean, there was one evening in particular, uh, he was supposed to be in the hospital for about a week after his first surgery, seven to 10 days. He ended up being there over 30. And at one in and out of ICUs and, and things like that. And, and one night they were doing a procedure just to as, assess um, a complication. It was supposed to be the simplest of all the things. And one of the doctors had said to me, this is a time where you can go home and rest. Both of our parents were there with him. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go home and rest. I'll have dinner with my kids. I got a call 30 minutes later that he aspirated and had to go on a ventilator and go into ICU. So then I'm rushing back to the hospital. So I thought I was making a good self-care decision in that moment that quickly changed. And so I think as a caregiver, you have to be prioritizing and making those choices and you have to be flexible and pivot. Um, you know, my two children were opposite in how they reacted. One wanted to be able to go to the hospital to see my husband, even though he had tubes and wires and things on him. The other wanted nothing to do with it and won't even get on FaceTime with him. And then I was navigating my husband's emotions that one of his children didn't want to see him. So there's a lot of mental health components to all this on top of the medical things you're trying to learn and understand. Um, there were things that were happening with him. And to Josie's point with the healthcare communication components that came up, you know, they couldn't explain a lot of what was happening. He was in a situation where they expected none of these complications. He was in good health and young for someone with esophageal cancer. He wasn't overweight, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke. And there was one point where uh, a situation occurred in the hospital and I was saying to the, one of his physicians, like, I just don't understand and why is this happening? And he couldn't explain them, but what he said to me, which was so helpful and anchoring right then is we can't explain this, but what you need to focus on right now is we were able to shrink the tumor, the surgery was successful and so, we will figure out how to get through these complications and he should be able to be here. And so he tried to help me navigate my thinking and framing, but I can't imagine if I wasn't able to have that conversation and what I would be able to do for myself and in turn for my family unit. Thank you, Heather. Wow. Um, you've described the roller coaster of the mental agility, the emotional agility that you need to display as a caregiver and all while you're, you yourself are a patient. And, um, and Josie, you know, you've obviously had to do something similar, learning a very kind of complex area of medicine. Um, and you touched on when you opened up um, the insights that the doctor gave you initially were those ones that helped you kind of feel confidence in your daughter's progress, um, small things like she was urinating, which was celebrated. And, jo and Heather, you've just described, you know, focusing on the tumor and, and, and being grateful that that was shrinking as well as managing the side effects. So there's all these sort of contrary decisions and emotions that you're asked to focus on. Josie, could you share a little bit more about how you began to navigate those complexities while you were still mothering two other children and managing your responsibilities what sort of learnings have you had along the way about how you managed to com compartmentalize some of those situations and keep yourself mentally sane in order to, to to be strong for your daughter yes it's definitely very tough at the beginning i i guess um you know, and I was actually working full time on the regional role that I have to try, have a lot of business trip. And like I say, I have two sons, both one was um, in university and one in, in high school, my daughter being the youngest. And it is like a sudden stop. We just have to sit down and deal with that as a family. And very fortunately, my husband was already retired at that point in time. So as a family, I think the first thing we did is that we all have to rally together as a family so that we will stay strong and have faith to ride through this together. So I think immediately uh, with this is that while my house, my daughter is actually recuperating when she out of the ECMO, um, operated on and fitted with the LVET, we have to figure out what's next because coming back her whole life and her whole 
I mean, she has to stop school. Everything has to be changed. Her diet, because she's on warfarin, and there are dietary components they have to watch out. There are food that she can't take. The things they have to watch out. So I think one of the things we did is that we sat down as a family, um, gather everyone together and communicate exactly her condition, what are her medication, her schedule, um, her medical visits, her tests that she needs to go through, understanding that the machine that she has has to be with her 24-7. And uh, then we have a dog, actually. My daughter loves my dog, which is the Golden Retrieval. And the, the doctor wasn't very excited that the fact that there is a dog because that may uh, come in in a harm way and may harm her. But she loves the dog so much. We were able to convince the doctor that our dog was very well kept and we took good care of him and he should not be a threat to my daughter. And uh, he did. The dog, somehow the dog really understood. Um, his name is Rex when we got home. Rex uh, was able to figure out there is something different with my daughter. That's a machine. I think his sensory level was a lot higher. Um, so, so we were very happy with that because she was really looking forward to that. And what I did is that even in the initial stages, that every morning, uh, in the end, I ran the morning shift. My husband do the night shift. We were there 24 seven for my daughter because we believe that what well, medicine can only help to a certain extent, I think being with her, morally supporting her and working alongside with her and the healthcare workers can help her whole healing journey. So that it took upon myself and my husband to do that. And obviously I took a long, long break from my work, which I'm really, really thankful for, to my employer for allowing me to do that. And my boss was really nice. She called me from Australia and said just, Take whatever time you need to get your daughter out of the hospital and home safely. So I'm really, really grateful for that and appreciate that. So I, I think organizing because caregiving can't just fall on one person. It's going to be very, very tough. Uh, we have to rally everyone around us. So in particular, our family is the first group of people that we rally around how each one of us can play a role in helping out understanding my daughter's condition. I think one of the first thing that we come to term with is not just talking about getting her to recover physically. I think the other piece is mentally, you know, uh, because she's 18. It's like, oh, what's, what's happening to me? Why am, why am I here? And I can't do anything now. She can't go swimming. She loves swimming because with the equipment with you 24 seven, water is taboo. You, it can't be near water. Yeah. So that's something she has to give up. So it's a complete change of the way we're going to live our life, uh, and how we're going to deal with that. So we just want to take one day at a time. So besides her medical needs, um, she also needs to be, uh, ha how should I say? She also needs daily dressing on her exit site that's under a sterile environment. So fortunately, me and my husband were certified by the healthcare group to be able to do that. So while I'm outstations, my husband take care of that and we rotate the role. So that helps. And I have, a, fortunately, we have a leave in a uh, female helper. So while I'm outstation, she will able to help out and help my daughter with all the feminine needs, uh, because otherwise the rest are all guys in the house. Yeah. So they were able to help out in that area. The other thing that we did that is that how do we help the mental piece, which is really, really the toughest piece, because we have to be there to be strong. So she cannot see us as not strong because we all have to be there to help her and understand her condition and situation and let her live her life as much as possible. So one of the things we did is that we say, okay, year one, we kind of put like um, each year is a target. We start with year one. The immediate year one is recovery, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So I think that's how we map that out. So what we did is that we uh, brought her out to movies and now become, like, let's do movie as a family. Yeah. So once she's fit enough to get out, we go movies together. Um, we went out to have dinner together, uh, going to her favorite restaurant barring those food that she can't eat. Um, and what we did is that every month 
whenever possible, we try to celebrate, meaning to say we garner the whole, bring in the extended family and friends. And we do like, you know, if this month is September, all the September babies, we will host a September baby celebration in someone's home, not just our home. So that that way we forge the bonding. So that helps the family members, the extended family members, the friends to get to understand her condition, able to start that bonding and give her that support and the reassurance that you know, we're all there for her and she has to be strong. And obviously, uh, we also find every reason when it's festive season, be it like um, here is the new year, the Chinese new year, or we call the Lantern Festival and even Christmas. We find every reason to bring families, extended families, friends together to really do the bonding. And that really, um, we felt that really helped uh, my daughter towards that journey. And year two, she was fairly more independent and more mobile to move around. So year two, we kind of map out and say, year two is the, uh, the back to school year. And that's how we frame that whole up. So I think we, what we try to do is to take one time, one year at a time or one day at a time and one month at a time. And, but truly I think caregiving is really about, um, gathering everyone around you on how to help. So having said that as the, how does the healthcare comes in? Like I said earlier on, when we make that connection, we, was spending so much, I was spending so much time in the hospital with my daughter. So beyond spending so much time, obviously is having communication and connecting with the, the uh, healthcare staff around her, be the doctor, be her surgeon, be the nurses around her, be the uh, coordinators that does her. And over time, I think we do develop a reasonable, uh, trust in that relationship. And in many ways, we exchange information of where we could help because we felt that it's not just healthcare. You take care of the clinical part, but we can help in many ways that to, to on this journey. So I think with that um, information or timely information became very crucial. So we were able to navigate through this uh, quite stably over time, uh, which um, we were very, very grateful to many, many of our friends, family, doctors and many in healthcare who really, really went the extra mile to really make my daughter feel uh, assured. And even with that, the physiotherapy, she has to go for physiotherapy. And we uh, diligently ensure that she gets to do her physio with the physiotherapy in a more controlled environment all through the years. In fact, she only passed out in May this year as considered the end of a session uh, post-transplant. So, so with that, I think that allows my daughter also be able to interact with the healthcare staff over time. And uh, what we have done is that they also tap on us, the healthcare group, on how we could be able to share back our experience and our story to new uh, patients coming on board to embrace the the uh, the Alvet. At the same time, patients who are on the uh, waiting list for heart transplants. And we had done numerous sessions uh, sharing those experiences with them. And that has also helped them to make decisions of where they want to go and how they want to take their life to the next uh, level. So I think um, this has really, really um, helpful. And we are very, very uh, grateful that there's so many people showed so much love. And I said earlier on, you know, it's like really believing in love and faith that can make the impossible possible. So, you know, Heather, my heart goes out to you hearing your story. It is definitely not very easy. So, um, yeah, so so I think thank one you, of the Jay. things, yeah, thank you. That, that was amazing. I think you've described from the dog being part of the journey to the family, to your community, and wow, um, how lucky your daughter is to have an amazing mom. Um, pioneering her advocacy through this very long journey and congratulations to you I'm sure it's been a lot of ups ups and downs and and Heather maybe you could take us through your journey um you talked to initially about reaching out to that cancer community uh, the advocacy groups that existed in Philadelphia and maybe you can tell us a little bit more about 
how they helped you and your family on your journey and any other groups that have been important in that journey in the last year or so? Absolutely. Um, I think to your last comment, Catherine, I was amazed how many amazing organizations are out there that you don't know about because you don't need to know about them. So I know personally, we blogged during my husband's journey and I tried over, you know, if there was a week here or there that there was not some major thing I needed to announce to try in my own personal blogs to put like, this organization exists and here's who they are and what they do. Um, everyone's Everyone knows somebody impacted by cancer. And so I think I would say, you know, there's amazing organizations that exist that focus on a variety of different areas. Uh, I'll start with my husband, in addition to the CSC Philadelphia area that helped my son in that way, which is what led me to want to be at CSC. Um, at my husband's hospital, there was a group of men who predominantly are who get esophageal cancer that had a support group. And a few of them proactively reached out to him when he got diagnosed and before his surgery, invited him to a lunch. And so three guys sat down with him at a table to just talk to him person to person about what questions he had or what to expect. His journey did not go as the expected plan, but at least he had people to connect to. Um, I personally, uh, one of my lemonades through it was finding an amazing therapist who um, is tremendous, but that wasn't what was a fit for my husband. And so this group, he's still a part of today. And uh, I, I think one of the important themes is, and what I love about CSC is meeting people where they are. Each person needs something different. All the answers are right. Uh, you probably won't know what you need until you're in a situation because until you walk into the shoes of what Josie's story, mine, Catherine, yours, you can't really predict um, what that might mean. Uh, so at CSC, you know, one of the things that resonated for me is that it really supports all people impacted by cancer. And often people focus on a patient and not the whole um, constituent of people that are touched by an experience. And so uh, helping have a voice at that table and being able to bring that forward was really important to me. I think we have a variety of different ways that I'll just use CSC as an example, but as I said, I think many organizations offer different things. Uh, so we have network partners, which are communities across the U.S. So if someone wants an in-person experience or to create a virtual support group, that exists. If someone's looking for a helpline and navigation, there's phone, there's text, there's multiple languages. I think that's another important thing as well um, throughout the US, uh, finding organizations that are able to support whatever la first language you have or what you're, you're most comfortable with to get the education information or support that you need. There's online communities where we have discussion boards for people that have similar um, disease types or symptoms and side effects, but it also has calendaring and education materials. Josie was using her community example of what she was organizing. Some people need help with transportation to treatments. Sometimes you can't get out to go pick up the food that you need in your home because you can't leave the patient. Your child might need someone to get them to an activity so that they can keep their normal so you can be taking care of the patient. So having accessibility to know those types of tools exist. Uh, Josie mentioned nutrition. I think from a cancer standpoint, no matter what kind of cancer you have, nutrition and eating is always a top issue and concern and need. So having access to a dietitian or nutritionist or recipes and things like that, we, we have um, our helpline offers distress screening for not just the patient, but also the caregiver and helping them depending on what shows up in that intake session, getting them to different places that could help them with that. I think no matter what you're impacted with um, supporting as a caregiver, treatment decision-making, how to know how to do that when you're entering into a realm that's different. And, you know, we have different programs and once again, booklets, whatever type of format is helpful video of what are things you could ask? What are things you're supposed to think about? Because often the quality of life decisions a patient would want to make and a caregiver may not be the same. And being able to talk through that, think through that, um, and as a caregiver, share your perspective and respect the decision of a patient is a really hard journey to go through. Um, and then I think also 
you know, someone might, I, I think a lot of people's perceptions, once again, if you haven't been through something personally, is the transition to when something quote on paper looks like it's done in terms of in cancer, like chemotherapy or radiation or a surgery, there's a really long journey after that. You know, my husband had probably about nine months of treatment surgeries and things on paper, but over four years had reoccurrent side effects, surgeries, symptoms, issues. Um, and I'll say still today for the rest of his life, he can't sleep flat. He has to sleep at an angle. He can't ever eat the way he did. Um, so even though I think from the outside, most people would view that he looks healthy, he seems happy and engaged from a society standpoint, but there's a lot of things that happen behind a door that people don't know. And so being a caregiver, trying to be supportive of that um, journey and being able to get the help that you need through that's really important. So I would also add um, from a policy standpoint in the nation of supporting caregiver needs is really important. I think there's a huge emphasis on patient and that's an area where CSC as well as other organizations try to have advocacy and support of caregiver needs, whether it's the time off that's needed or things of that nature to support the patient and the outcomes that they could have from that. Thank you, Heather. Wow. Um... There's so many ways that I'd love to, to take the conversation in terms of the learnings that you two women have between you. Um, but I'm gonna pick up Josie on something that Heather just said, and maybe you could give us a perspective on it. And that was um, around her husband's mental health. And, and you talked about it with your daughter and, and Heather just said that she found that he needed to speak to other patients who were in his position to sort of meet him where they were. Tell us a little bit about um, your daughter's experiences with, with other patients that she might have met and then how you have pivoted into your advocacy role to help those other families. Has your daughter been able to talk to other patients? Has she had that sort of um, bonding experience? And how have you found that has helped her journey um, as, a, as a patient? Yes, definitely, Catherine. As I mentioned earlier, I think with our initial uh, relationship with the healthcare, I think that's where um, when the Singapore um, Patients Advocacy Network was looking for uh, setting up a group of volunteers to looking for the voices of uh, patients as part of the overall strategy, um, I was approached and I definitely thought that uh, I would like to be part of the uh, the uh, voluntary group to be able to give back to the bigger community to help other patients along on their journey. Because like I say, I spend so much time in the hospital. Not only I look after my daughter, I have so much time to observe what is going on and able to understand that where could be some of this gap can be and how could I help. Uh, that's one. And the second is that my daughter, because Jim being a patient, I think like Heather mentioned, there's a lot of community out there or called the patient's care group. There are many patients care group. And similarly, in her con my daughter's condition, they are also called uh, Alveda. I think I'm also connected on a Facebook with the US Alveda's group too. So I think the whole idea is that we, it's a big community out there. How do we uh, leverage learning, help one another out? How could we communicate? It's like, um, so that that way are uh, two ways. So allowing my daughter to be able to speak to, like I said, incoming patients that's going to take on this vet because my daughter didn't have a chance to be able to say that she had or didn't have a chance or a choice because she was already on the ECMO where she needed the uh, uh, the vet to help her to save her life. But some patients may have that choice, know that the heart is failing, but they are not keen to have that machine within them 24 seven with the cable coming out of the body. So having said that, um, so this is where my daughter does help to support and talk to other patients in the patient's group or incoming new patients, uh, how do we interact? And that also allow her to enrich herself that, hey, it's not just me. There are many out there. They're probably also going to some of this similar journey. So that how do we rally around and help one another on this journey together? And even recently, there were two ladies um, that was around the same age as my daughter who had almost a similar kind of problem. 
So now they are going through this. I think that kind of helped her to be able to mentally frame up uh, accepting this and that's how do we go forward. You know, We can't turn back the clock. We can only go forward and make it a better day tomorrow. So having said that, I think in my advocacy role, I think with that is I felt there are many ways we could uh, be a patient voice. It's not just about helping patients today. There are many things. One very simple one I could think of is that many a time as, pati as patient, we, I have witnessed with my own eyes is having difficulty communication with the medical staff or the healthcare staff, uh, uh, particularly like medical jargons, you know, because the uh, nurse, the doctors, they're so used to using some of these uh, medical terms and jargon, but it may not mean a thing to patients or the family, you know, even simple word like ambulate. And then some people may say, what, what do you mean? You're going to amputate? Uh, they have no idea what you're talking about. And that actually raises the anxiety level. So what we have done, some of the work in the advocacy network is that we work on a very simple level is what does the patient wants? Yeah. Uh, so we came up with a very simple toolkit with what we call uh, English grocery, grocery where we actually had some words as medical term and how do we make it into a layman term? So then we work together with the healthcare staff. Uh, of course, we can't reach every single one, but I mean, we're working on ensuring that at least the onboarding program, the orientations for the doctors, the nurses and uh, ongoing, that we all be mindful that the, the terminology, the jargons that we use as we are communicating with patients are so critical using the right terms that we can then bring the patients to the level that we understand one another. And that definitely allay a lot, a lot of fear and concern from the parents and the family perspective. So I think that's how we can say we can bridge that. And there's something we see that we could do from a patient perspective on how we can work alongside with the healthcare group to bridge this together so that we could you know, be able to establish a better healing journey for our patients going forward. Yeah. That's amazing, Josie. Yes, those words that the nurses and doctors use every day can be so confusing, especially when patients and caregivers maybe aren't listening. They're hearing, but they're not listening and they, they can't always take it in. So those resources must be extremely important. Heather, I know you've obviously evolved a resource uh, catalogue um, from your perspective, what are the some maybe some things that you've done differently um, with the the CSC as a result of being both a patient and a caregiver, and maybe some some new resources mm -hmm. you might have developed as a result of your journey? Absolutely, um, and I'll say Josie and Catherine, I completely relate uh, to the terminology. We we try and do a lot of things like that as well. Um, I'll make one quick personal comment on that and, and then um, address your question, Catherine, which is palliative care was a personal word that came up for me um, that we were discussing that my husband needed palliative care. I literally thought that meant like, oh, they're telling me he's dying and people need to come in to help us, not understanding that it was supportive care. And um, that is something that I brought with me to CSC. When I work with our research team, we often talk about the words we're picking um, where we're using our learnings. And while they're often in scientific settings or peer situations where the people might know those words, trying to be really thoughtful when we're uh, using it with different stakeholders to try and change the language so that people understand uh, the learnings and experiences that we're trying to lend a voice to for patients and caregivers. And that brings me to the Cancer Experience Registry, which is the online survey that we have at CSD that we relaunched in October of last year that is open to anyone impacted by cancer, patient or caregiver for any cancer type. And one of the, uh, there's several things that we did in this relaunch, but one in particular that I'm really excited and proud of that ties to uh, my journey as well as what our team really thought would add value to the broader story that we could tell in the community is something called pairing and dyadic data. So we have added where if a patient or caregiver take this survey that covers a huge variety of topics having to do with treatment decisions, um, financial experience, uh, quality of life, treatment, 
um, experiences for someone. If you nominate your loved one, we can then compare those learnings and start to tell stories about the differences or commonalities that occur and the influence that a caregiver has on patient outcomes. And I will say personally, and Catherine and Josie, you might relate, but when I will say what at, almost every time I was with my husband in a doctor's office and they would ask him about his symptoms or side effects, his answer and mine were quite different. And so um, what he would go through behind our walls of what was most difficult or um, that he had a question about wasn't always what he raised in the doctor's office. And it was really um, interesting to me on a personal front that has uh, brought some other lenses to the work that we're doing in our team that the group was, you know, found important before, but I will say has offered other perspectives that we've talked about in our group and excited for where we're going to be able to go with our learnings from our registry. And, um, you know, every voice counts and helps tell a different story because everyone's journey is different, even if you have the same disease. I love how you're using science, Heather, um, not only in Obviously, we use science to develop new, new drugs, new medicines, but you're using science to help develop new communication strategies to enhance our ability to care for the patient more holistically. And I think it's a fantastic synergy that it's not just the drugs and the doctors and the nurses, it's the whole patient. And that communication story is so powerful and so important. And Josie, you've been amazing at articulating your your story powerfully for us and the team. And I wonder just from a personal perspective in the last few minutes, Josie, would you be prepared to sort of share a couple of tips that you've learned along the way for how you have stayed strong and, and just to, and I'll ask Heather you to do the same. What have you learned on this journey from a personal perspective? Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. And I think, uh, I, uh, Heather, I really can resonate with some of the points that you have raised tonight, definitely. Um, being caregiving is definitely not easy and I have to make a lot of tough decisions, uh, you know, including the one that I have to, um, you know, to retire, for example. But um, I'm, I'm truly happy that one of the things I learned on this caregiving journey is to really, really have faith. I think that's very important. Uh, to me, uh, prayer is one of the biggest uh, area that I rely on. I felt that prayer is something that is invisible, but it helps to cool and calm down the body and soul and mind. Um, be able to rally people around me, um, from the family to the extended family, to friends and to obviously the healthcare, able to work through with them for little, little steps of success, a little, little improvement over time has really been helpful. And I felt uh, very inspired by the people around me that um, there are many ways uh, that we do. And I, I do felt that based on my beginning, as I mentioned, kindness. I think kindness is a very, very powerful. We talk about compassion and kindness. I felt that one of the biggest thing that uh, we can do, uh, I learned as a caregiver, is showing kindness both sides. I think it takes two hands to clap. While we as patients and family, there are many, many uh, moments that we go through can be heartbreaking. But um, if we also take a time to show a little bit of kindness back to the healthcare group, because we are in this together, it is a journey that we have to work hand in hand. I, I think at the end of the day, is that I'm, I'm very happy to say that I was able to work alongside with many of these people and we can stay connected, sharing, and that has enriched me as an individual and as a mother, and as a caregiver, how could I do better? What can I do better tomorrow? The next day is something new that I can create, you know, um, that can help uh, my daughter on this journey. So even little thing like creating hobby, by the way, my daughter, learn to make lego and she loves lego she has a whole streets of lego bricks uh, her biggest was a bugatti fantastic okay. thank you so you talked about prayer your personal way of calming down you talked about kindness um heather what are the things you've learned on your journey or the things that you put in place to help you power through sure. um to build on joan disease um suggestions to start uh, i would say don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> um, 
prioritize. You're not going to do everything. So what are the most impactful or important things that matter to you personally or professionally? Uh, making sure you take a moment for yourself, whether it's a walk with a friend or um, being able to meditate for five minutes. What is it that you need to refuel yourself and to make sure you're still staying engaged with um, your broader community, however that's defined, being thankful um, and, and the help for others. I think one of the other things that I often talked about with my children, especially in the beginning was almost everybody has some challenge that's going on. And so really um, whether you can see something going on or not, doesn't mean that there aren't things happening in people's lives and to just, you know, give grace and space and assume positive intent in whatever is happening around you. And I, I would like to echo what Josie said. I think the nurses and the medical team were beyond fantastic, um, you know, gave us their cells to be able to text during certain stages of crises and, you know, being able to, I still choose to participate on a volunteer board at Penn Medicine, which is where we were treated, um, try and participate in campaigns for them. They, you know, they give of themselves and want to be there to help you. And so they may or may not understand all the nuances of some of what we go through, but the the intent and the spirit is 1000% there. And so being appreciative of them and trying to help inform in ways like the volunteer committee uh, really makes me feel like I'm helping them be able to fulfill what they want to be able to do for people. That's awesome. I think I'll echo the thankfulness for the medical staff. Um, even though there's frustrations along the way and sometimes you feel like you're not getting what you need or that you don't understand or you can't get hold of the doctor sometimes, just trying to be grateful and always be positive with them um, so that you get the best out of them, I think has, has been a learning on my journey as well. So um, Heather, Josie, you've been incredibly generous with your personal perspectives on our advocacy journey. I know I've learned a lot and been inspired by your strength and courage and focus. And um, I know your families have benefited from your true leadership on this advocacy journey and that you're now benefiting many more people with your involvement and your focus 100% on becoming advocates for a, a much wider group of patients than your immediate family. So from that perspective, thank you for giving back to our communities. And I'm going to hand it back now to Brad to close us out. Thank you very much, Catherine. And thanks to all three of you for all the sharing and spending time with us today. I said in the beginning, and now everyone can understand what I meant about this being an incredibly powerful panel. And one of the things in particular, personally, I'd like to focus on for just one second and to praise is the authenticity and the vulnerability that our panelists shared. That being powerful in these spaces as an advocate, as a caregiver, in seeking to care for oneself, is also recognizing the complexities and being honest and seeking support. Something I need to work on <laughs> in my own life. So I don't mean to pretend it's easy because we know it's not. But just an important thing to say out loud and acknowledge from our wonderful panelists who deserve lots of celebration for being here today. And to follow up with just a reminder of a lovely bit of advice one of our community members, Dee, put in the chat way back at the beginning about saying something nice to yourself about yourself is a great way to begin this. Having thanked all of our panelists, I'd like to also thank all of you for being here with us and participating and sharing your experiences and being with each other in the chat. As always, if you're interested in viewing prior sessions or for more information on upcoming sessions, like our next one on the 6th of October, please visit theadvocacyexchange.com. We look forward to seeing you then. Please take that as your invitation. And we are always excited to spend more time with you and support each other's advocacy journeys. So on behalf of everyone, thank you for spending the time today. And we're excited to see you in a little more than a month. <laughs>